why is phytoplankton that important? Well, that's interesting. It sounds like a simple question, but sometimes it's hard to explain to people something they can't see. How important it is. Wow, look at all that phytoplankton. The easiest way to answer this question may be for a simple demonstration of breathing out and breathing in. Let's start with breathing in. That's good. So basically about 3.5 billion years ago you wouldn't be able to do that because there was no oxygen in yeah. the atmosphere. So around about that time, give or take 100 or 200 million years, <laughs> a small microscopic phytoplankton evolved that actually could do photosynthesis and create oxygen. So it took about Oh, another billion and a half years, give or take a few hundred million years, to actually have enough oxygen in the atmosphere from all of that photosynthetic activity to actually be significant levels in the atmosphere. And that was a really important step because from an evolutionary perspective, to have oxygen in the atmosphere allows for the evolution of aerobic organisms. And that's basically on the principle of the fact that when you do the Krebs cycle, aerobic metabolism, you produce a lot more ATP than on the anaerobic metabolism. Mm. So you can sustain more complex multicellular organisms. Mm. So now we come up to the current day. So now at, we're phytoplankton producing over 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere every year. It's produced every year in the atmosphere. So you can see that that's really important. In fact, you might want to take, as you breathe in, occasionally, <laughs> thank the phytoplankton. <laughs> yeah. As you can see from Dr. Flip's introduction, phytoplankton is extremely important in the marine environment. However, since they are microscopic, it can be very difficult to study and observe them empirically, so special preparation of the samples are needed. We are here to walk you future phytoplankton enthusiasts through the step-by-step -step process of collecting, preserving, and analyzing phytoplankton. This diagram shows the basic structure for collecting phytoplankton data. The method of phytoplankton analysis that we use in our lab and that we'll be discussing today is the Udermol method. This method, developed in 1958 by German phytoplankton aficionado Hans Udermol, is one of the most commonly used methods for quantifying phytoplankton communities. It was developed so that phytoplankton cells could easily be counted and identified. The method is simple and takes very little equipment other than an inverted microscope, so it's practical for scientists on a budget. Also, using an iodine-based preservative means the analyst can remain relatively safe while inspecting the specimens. In order to successfully collect the data needed for observing phytoplankton, several different materials are needed. First of all, you need a boat and access to the specific location that you want to collect your samples from. This could range anywhere from shallow to deep water. Often, it is beneficial to compare phytoplankton samples from different locations in order to determine which species are present in each and even where blooms are likely to occur around the world. We collected water samples from Seahorse Key in order to observe phytoplankton species present in the area. The first of the materials needed for these collections is an integrated pole sampler. Here you can see how an integrated pole sampler is used. It is very similar to a drinking straw in that you have to make sure that it is sealed at one end when it is pulled out of the water. This ensures that water doesn't come out of the bottom of the pole until the top is uncorked. This sampler ranges in size depending on what depth you are collecting your samples from. For the purpose of our experiment that we conducted, we used one that was 1.5 meters long. A bucket is also needed to put the water in as you are collecting it. We did five grabs with the integrated pole to ensure that we collected a representative sample of the photic zone. The water collected from each of the five grabs was put in the bucket. Some experiments also look at the benthic environment. For these experiments, a different sampling technique is used. However, for the purpose of our demonstration, we were only interested in collecting samples from the water column. The water was then mixed thoroughly by stirring and a funnel was used to transfer the water into the sampling bottles. It is important that these bottles are amber to reduce exposure to light. Usually we would add preservative immediately after collection, but it is okay to preserve later as long as the samples are protected from light and you preserve them as soon as possible. It is also important to label the bottles so that they are not mixed up before they get back to the lab. After the samples are collected, they are taken back to the lab for further research. 
Later, we will discuss more about how the samples are preserved with Lugol solution and how they are set up in settling chambers to be looked at under an inverted microscope. It is not only important to collect the actual samples when in the field, though. It is also important to document the conditions of the surrounding environment, like the weather, turbidity of the water, time of collection, and so forth. This chart shows some of this data that was collected on the day of our field trip. We collected our samples in water that was approximately 6 feet deep. We also used a Secchi disk to determine the clarity of the water. As you can see from the picture, a Secchi disk is a disk attached to a rope. The rope is lowered into the water until the disk disappears from view. The rope is typically marked at particular increments, such as at every 6 inches. This helps determine the water clarity because you are able to use the increments on the rope to determine the depth at which the disk disappears from view or the depth at which water clarity decreases. As you can see, when we performed this task with the Secchi disk, the disk was visible in the water down to a depth of 4.75 feet, which was the majority of the water column. This chart shows more of the conditional data that was collected the day that the samples were taken and also outlines the important information that is often recorded when phytoplankton studies are conducted. This information was retrieved using a YSI meter. As is obvious from the table, we only collected data from one depth. This is because we were limited by time and access to multiple depths since we collected this information while we were on our field trip to Seahorse Key. However, we left the rest of the table empty to demonstrate what would typically be done in an experiment like this one and to show that data is needed from multiple locations and multiple depths to better de understand the dynamics of the ocean. The factors that we obtained using the YSI were salinity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH of the water. These are important because they help provide more information on the state of the water where the phytoplankton samples are coming from. For example, if there was a bloom of a certain species, like if a red tide occurred, it could be beneficial to know what each of the values were for the factors listed above to determine if they could be playing a role in why the bloom occurred. This could also help with future studies because if one or more of these factors were found to be contributing to a bloom occurring, scientists may be able to predict when one would occur in the future. In theory, the best way to look at phytoplankton would be as a live sample. But since we can't feasibly go into the field and collect samples every day, preservation is necessary. Aldehyde-based preservatives are generally better than iodine-based Lugol solution when it comes to preserving samples over long periods of time. However, they are very hazardous and the fumes they produce can be a health risk. For this reason, the Udermol method uses Lugol solution, a solution made up of potassium iodide, iodine crystals, acetic acid, and water, which is much less hazardous. The disadvantages of using Lugol solution are that it breaks down with light and it also has a fairly short shelf life of about six months before more needs to be added. It also causes shrinkage of the phytoplankton cells that needs to be accounted for when calculating biovolumes. And the triiodide color dyes everything, including debris, brown. However, this is slightly advantageous because it colors the active cells very brown and makes them easier to enumerate. As stated before, it's relatively benign, and the added bonus is the iodine entering the cell membrane of the plankton makes them more dense and allows them to sink quickly. Here we have a short schematic of how the preservative affects the phytoplankton of interest. This happy-go-lucky dinoflagellate is enjoying its life of sunbathing until we add our Lugol solution. Now, since iodine by itself is not very soluble in water, we want to add a bunch of iodide in the form of potassium iodide to create triiodide that is quite soluble and creates this brown color. When this triiodide enters the cell of the phytoplankton, it kills it and makes the cell turn very dark, making it easy for the analyst to spot it when counting. Next, we wanted to show how to correctly assemble a settling chamber. As you can see from the picture, there are several different parts. Part A is the base of the chamber, and Part C fits down inside Part A so that the bottom is covered. Part B is like a tube, and vacuum grease is used as a sealer and is applied to one end of the tube. This end is then fit firmly down into Part A so that it creates a chamber. If this is done correctly, no liquid will be able to escape through the bottom of the chamber. It is important to gently shake the amber bottle before placing the phytoplankton sample in the settling chamber. 
This ensures that the water is well mixed so that an accurate representation of the phytoplankton species is observed. Part D is a cover slip and this part is placed on top of the settling chamber after the solution has been added to prevent oxygen from discoloring the sample while it settles. The samples typically need to sit for 24 hours after being set up in the settling chamber to allow the phytoplankton to settle to the bottom. After at least this much time has passed, the cover slips are removed from the top and a pipette is used to remove the majority of the water in the chamber. Approximately all but 2 to 3 milliliters of water is removed during this process. Since the phytoplankton has all settled to the bottom, removing this water will not affect the actual sample we are trying to study. It is often a good idea to set up two settling chambers for each sample that you are studying, in case one does not set up correctly or one sample is too dense to observe under the microscope. Typically in our lab, 10 milliliter samples are observed under the microscope because this provides a larger and therefore more diverse water sample to find the phytoplankton in. However, this could also be a disadvantage because with more water it is likely that the phytoplankton will be more dense and that debris in the sample will also be more dense. This often makes it hard to count the plankton in the sample. In these cases, 5 milliliters of water are used instead. This lowers the amount of water and therefore also makes the phytoplankton species easier to see and identify. This picture shows a 5 milliliter sample set up in a settling chamber on the left and a 10 milliliter sample on the right. Here is a diagram showing what is happening in the settling chamber. As you can see, at first the phytoplankton are evenly spread out throughout the chamber, and then they start to settle towards the bottom. Using an inverted microscope, we can look at the phytoplankton from the bottom of the chamber, enumerate, and identify them. But how do we go about counting all this phytoplankton, you may ask? Well, we usually count it at two different magnifications, 100 times and 400 times. The hundred times we will scan the entire bottom of the sampling chamber like this. We will do this for all phytoplankton that are easily seen at this magnification, which usually falls into the 30 micron or larger size range. For the 400 times count, we count all visible phytoplankton within 100 grids, stopping if we reach 100 individuals of a single species. There is a grid that is preset part of the microscope and we know its area in millimeters squared. So we multiply this area by 100 and that is our AC term. We also know the area of the chamber bottom and the volume V that we put in. So we can estimate the cells per mil for our sample using this equation. For the 100 times count, since we count the entire bottom area, these area terms equal 1, and we just multiply it by the 1 over volume term. But now for the fun part, let's look at some of the species we found in Seahorse Key. We photographed some different microorganisms found in our seahorse key water sample. Here we have a Dictyoka species with its characteristic silica spines. Here we have a large Cassinodiscus species, a centric diatom. Notice the mini punk dye. Next we have a beautiful centric chain of 30 Paralea cicada, a common species found in the Gulf and the Atlantic. Another centric diatom here, an Odontella mobilensis. It has four medial spines and four lateral horns, two on each end. This giraffe-shaped organism is a dinoflagellate of the serratium genus. You can see the cingulum in the middle and its very long spines. Now these are not phytoplankton, but ciliates, lovely little tintinids with their cool shells called loricas. Lastly, this 400 times magnification picture, you can see the rich diversity of small phytoplankton observed in our sample. It's amazing how much life exists in our marine environment on such a small scale. As you can see, phytoplankton research can be rigorous. However, it provides us with vital information for understanding the microecological community of the marine habitat. Large swings in species composition can completely change how an ecosystem functions and can have large implications to species in higher trophic levels. Therefore, it is important that we track these changes over time. I think that's good. You think that's good? I think that's good. You could yeah. edit this part. Yeah, this, this part is all edited. <laughs> this part you can edit. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of video. You can edit everything. That's